When does a species officially go extinct? If I bring up the topic of extinct species, what's the first species that you think of? Is it the dodo bird? Because that's what I originally think of. What are the chances that there are dodo birds still out there? The number's not zero, but it's pretty low considering that we haven't seen it in such a long time. But what is the designation of when a species goes from endangered to extinct? That's what we're going to talk about today. The motivation for this video was there was a bird found in Papua New Guinea that hadn't been documented since 1882. And this was a species that was thought to be extinct. There were some rumors that it was still around, but it hadn't been documented in over 140 years. So we got to the point now where we thought it was extinct. Turns out it's not. So what are the criteria that some of these scientists go through to decide and come out and say, you know what, this is extinct? Because it'd be a real shame for you to come out and say, yeah, I think this is an extinct species, and then for someone to find one uh, relatively soon. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is what is the designation for something becoming endangered? Endangered is a topic that is kind of complex. There are a lot of different ways for a species to become endangered, and I wanted to talk about some of the common ones that I found online. The first reason that a species becomes uh, endangered is that its species population is declining and it will need additional research and efforts to preserve the species. Currently to become endangered based off of this clause, the species needs to have a decline of 50 to 70% over 10 years or three generations, whichever one is longer. The idea behind this is that you have to have a reference point. Populations are changing at all times. You have a population that is going to boom and as a result will bust. We see this a lot with deer species uh, where you have good conditions, so the population booms, the quality of life decreases, and then the population shrinks. So the range of a healthy population dynamic is obviously changing all the time. So you need to have a reference point and that's why they use, uh, what was it, 10 years or three generations, whichever one is longer, to make sure that they don't jump the gun and say, oh, this species is in need of assistance, when maybe it's going through a natural uh, population dynamic. Number two, the second way for something to become endangered it has to do with its range. If the range of occurrence is less than 5,000 square kilometers or occupies less than 500 square kilometers, it will be considered endangered. So you have the idea of populations declining, but what happens when humans go in and are removing a uh, viable habitat for the species? If it gets towards uh, the point where there's only a little bit of land protected that the species occupies, that is a reason why you would need it to become additionally protected and have it be endangered. So, so have a range that it could be found of 5,000 kilometers or a range that is actually found right now of 500 square kilometers. Number three, a species can become endangered if the population has less than 2,500 mature individuals. This gets to the point where the genetics start to become a problem. You have inbreeding and as a result, uh, means that disease can easily spread throughout this population and that's why it might need to go into a, a genetic program uh, with the assistance of maybe zoos, just to make sure that there is as little inbreeding as possible to keep this population as healthy as possible. And that's why that designation of endangered at 2,500 mature individuals may come into play. And finally, if scientists gives the probability of extinction in the wild of at least 20% within 20 years or five generations, whichever one is longer, it will be considered endangered. So you, all this goes out the window if the estimates are that the population is going to go extinct with 20% certainty in the next 20 years. This means that scientists need to step in now, and if they don't, by the time the other uh, dynamics that I talked about where the population size decreases within uh, three generations, it may be too late. So you have to have this put in place to jump in in really dire cases, and I'm sure this has been used plenty of times. So that's the process of deciding if a species should become endangered. So you go from a healthy population to, ooh, things are not going so great, let's give it some additional funds and resources with endangered, but what happens if we're unable to save the species? First, we have extinct in the wild. This is a species that is no longer found in the wild, obviously based off the name, but it means that there are still individuals out there. This could be in a smaller population or it could be in a situation where the individuals from the wild are taken into captivity with the plans of rehabilitating and having you know, the reproduction happen uh, under the watchful eye of scientists to make sure that the genetics diversity stays healthy enough where they can eventually be reintroduced back into the wild. This is obviously something that you only need to do or you only want to do if things get really bad. So extinct in the wild means that there's hopes that they can be reintroduced in the future. But as of right now, if we let things go on the way they were, it was likely going to go extinct. So some of the examples I could see of that were the scimitar aurochs and the Christmas Island chain gecko. Both species have efforts underway with breeding populations in captivity with the hopes of reintroducing them back into their historical range in the next couple of years. And finally, we go to extinct as a designation. The IUCN, or the International Union for Conservation of Nature, is the oldest group for designating conservation statuses. And for the longest time, they used 50 years without a sighting as the designation for being extinct. This makes a lot of sense. 
you have to come up with some sort of range to decide that all of the efforts have been made to try to find the species, and if you can't find one after 50 years, likelihood is it's probably extinct. This was used from the 1800s up until the 1990s when they came up with a definition that is currently being used today. And the definition of extinct used by the IUCN is that the species is extinct when there is no reasonable doubt that the last remaining individual of a species has died. It needs systematic and time-appropriate surveys uh, that have been unable to record a single individual. The time-appropriate surveys means that if you're looking for something that only comes out in the spring, that means they're not setting up surveys during the middle of winter when you're not going to actually be able to find it. So you need systematic surveys to make sure that we are, without a doubt, trying to find the last remaining individuals. And if you can't do that, that's when you can designate that a species could be extinct. Some of the methods that they use are going to be human surveys, camera traps, and drones as a way to try to identify areas of interest that you may want to look into the future, uh, especially in the very remote areas of the wilderness. You find areas that you haven't been able to search thoroughly, set up camera traps, and hopefully find some evidence, whether it be tracks, uh, drop-ins, or just the call of the species that you're looking for. And if you can't find that, that's when you can start designating it as being extinct. A lot of the efforts for conservation have been done by citizen scientists. These are people that don't work full-time as a scientist, but they're out in the wild. You have a lot of birders that have a lot of knowledge. And as a result, you can start passing that on. You have some apps um, like iNaturalist where you're able to take pictures of things and scientists are able to see if it comes up as a rare or potentially endangered species. So if you're out in the wild and you see a species that you don't recognize, it may be beneficial if you can to try to take a picture of it because you could be the one that's able to identify a species that was thought to be extinct and you'd probably get some articles written about you, but that's pretty cool. But the more information that we can have passed on to the public, that's why I think some apps like Picture This and iNaturalist are so beneficial because you have people interested in finding out the differences between varying species. And as a result, you get more information on species, their native range, and where they're going to be found. So this is just a question that I had in my mind. What makes a designation of being extinct? Is it a time frame? Is it a, an effort thing? It seems like in the 1990s and before, it was 50 years without sighting. And now it just means that you have, without reasonable doubt, have used all the surveys that you possibly can find. And if you can't find one, that's when you can start designating it as being extinct. And that's why you're able to find this bird in Papua New Guinea that was thought to be extinct since 1882. And you just find one in the wild and you're able to photograph it. So that's a pretty cool story. Let me know what you thought the definition of extinct would be. And if you have a topic you'd like me to discuss in a future video, be sure to leave it down below. Thanks for watching. My name is Andy and I will see you in the next video.